Good morning, South Carolina. Welcome to SCR's 2022 Virtual Fair Housing Conference. We appreciate you taking time out of your day to tune in. Every year in April, realtors commemorate the passage of the Fair Housing Act of 1968 with events and education that highlight the ongoing efforts of realtors to tackle the issue of discrimination in housing. Fair Housing Month signifies a recommitment to expanding equal access to housing and is a reminder to all that fair housing is not an option, it's the law. To celebrate Fair Housing Month, I'm issuing a challenge to all who are tuning in today, and especially those who hold voluntary leadership positions at SCR. The challenge includes three components, completion of NAR's Fair Haven simulation training, completion of implicit bias training, and completion of the At Home with Diversity certification. So why should you accept this challenge? Because realtors are leaders in change. And in the pursuit of leading change for the better, this is our chance to demonstrate that each of us stands up for diverse, inclusive communities where everyone is welcome. We abide by a code of ethics that ensures fairness within our profession and the dream of home ownership for all. We have an important and insightful agenda lined up for you, so please stay tuned throughout the entire conference. Those who complete the entire program will be entered into our grand prize drawing, a free registration to SCR's annual conference, Home Ownership Heroes at the Greenville Hyatt Regency, September 14th through the 16th. Today, we'll touch on important subjects like fair housing pitfalls that could get you into hot water, issues like love letters and divisive symbols and listings are hot topics and you need to be in the know. We'll also learn the basics of service animal accommodations, followed by a test of your legal knowledge. After that, we'll learn about unconscious bias, and then we'll get a data breakdown from NAR Research on its 2022 race and home buying report. Then we'll hear firsthand DEI perspectives from a few of your realtor colleagues. And we're really excited to have our keynote speaker, Anton Gunn, with us today to discuss the advantages of diversity in your business. But before we begin, I'd like to introduce SCR past president, Owen Tyler. Owen elevated the issue of diversity during his presidency with the development of the SCR's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council. He's here today to tell us a little more about this invaluable asset to our association, how it came about, what they're currently working on, and their goals for the future. Thank you so much, Cindy, and thank you all for tuning in today. I'm excited to be here with you to discuss the important topic of diversity. As realtors, fair housing binds us all together. Our promise that our clients have equal access to the dream of home ownership and the right to private property promotes a free and open real estate market. As social unrest swept across the country during 2020, we began asking the tough questions of our realtor members. The answers were difficult but provided a glimpse into discrimination some of our members, clients, and customers experience on a daily basis. And from that introspection, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council was born. Since its inception, the Council has been hard at work. Last year, SCR Secretary Keon Aldrich was at the helm as the chair of SCR's first DEI Council. She, along with 13 members of the committee, formulated a strategic plan that included actionable steps to continue DEI in every aspect of our association. This year, we're continuing that work with an integration of DEI content into existing communication channels such as SCR's weekly report and the SCR Good Life podcast. We've created a fair housing seminar for local boards and brokerages to learn the history of fair housing and risk management for fair housing laws. SCR has recently created an online form to report harassment complaints. We have received our first complaint this year, which was submitted anonymously. We allow anonymous complaints so that people feel comfortable coming forward to help eradicate harassment in our industry. SCR also continues to advocate for diversity legislation such as the hate crimes bill and removing discriminatory, discriminatory covenants and restrictions. And SCR is excited to have established a Leadership Academy Diversity Scholarship to create a pipeline for diversity members to get involved in leadership. The DEI Council will continue to advocate for equal access to housing and diversity initiatives within our industry. As you can see, DEI is and will continue to be a cornerstone of SCR's priorities because it's the cornerstone of our ethical obligation as realtors. 
It is what binds us all in our profession. Thank you for being here today. And always remember, diversity is not about how we differ. It is about embracing one another's uniqueness. Our strengths lie in our differences, not in our similarities. Our next speaker is Alexia Smokler, who is the Senior Policy Representative for Fair Housing for the National Association of Realtors. She represents NAR's position to Congress and federal agencies on fair housing issues and advocates to advance fair housing in our industry. Before joining NAR, Alexia worked in fair housing enforcement at HUD and with nonprofit civil rights organizations. Today, she'll be speaking to us about the history of fair housing and how that history helped shape our future. Alexia, I'll let you take it away and thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Tiara, for the introduction and the invitation. You are doing fantastic work. And greetings, South Carolina Realtors. I'm really grateful for this opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Alexia Smokler, and I work for NAR here in Washington, D.C. At NAR, we believe that making the benefits of homeownership available to the broadest possible group of qualified buyers, not only is that good for business, it's good for families, it's good for communities, and it's good for our American economy. But we acknowledge that not all Americans have been able to access home ownership on equal terms. The racial home ownership gap in America, a chasm of 30 points between Black Americans and whites, it's virtually the same today as it was in 1968 before passage of the Federal Fair Housing Act. And it's getting bigger. And many of our communities are as racially segregated today as they were back then. Now, we know that this gap and these divided communities, they're not just the natural consequence of people's individual choices. Throughout the first two thirds of the 20th century, Government at all levels, the housing industry, financial institutions, and private citizens work together to limit where people would be allowed to live based on their race or their national origin. In the white neighborhoods, government programs and financial institutions supported home ownership with loans and other investments. Black Americans and Black neighborhoods were denied those opportunities. And even where Black Americans were able to achieve home ownership and build businesses, in spite of all those obstacles, in many cases, those homes, those businesses, that wealth was destroyed. The consequences of these historic actions have resonated down through generations. We still live with them today. So the Fair Housing Act of 1968 made housing discrimination illegal. But before the Fair Housing Act, generations of buyers were unfairly shut out of the opportunity to own a home, build equity, and pass that wealth down to their children. The 1968 law made discrimination illegal, but it didn't provide any remedy for those generations of lost opportunity. Let's talk about a few of the ways public policy and industry practice denied home ownership and wealth building opportunities for people of color. Let's start with racial zoning. This became a widespread practice in the 1910s and 1920s during the Great Mig Migration of Black Americans out of the rural South and into Southern cities and the North. As this massive population shift occurred, many cities passed zoning ordinances explicitly limiting where occupants could live according to their race. You see here a flyer associated with a campaign for a racial, or racial zoning ordinance in St. Louis in 1916. It warns white residents that their block will be ruined by quote, Negro invasion 
and that in order to, quote, save their homes, they should vote for segregation. Now, the Supreme Court struck down explicit racial zoning as unconstitutional in 1917. But cities found other ways to put laws on the books to limit where people could live according to their race and to ensure that neighborhoods wouldn't integrate. In many cities, segregation was tied to wider community planning goals. For example, in 1924, the city of Columbia, South Carolina passed its zoning ordinance. You can see in the text excerpted here that the ordinance made no mention of race. On its face, it complies with the Supreme Court decision outlawing explicit racial zoning. So what did this ordinance do to quote, protect the residence sections and quote, conserve property values? Well, the ordinance rezoned almost all black streets and neighborhoods to business or industrial use, while all white areas remained residential zones. In Columbia, affluent white neighborhoods like Wales Garden and Heathwood were rigidly zoned to encourage development of single family homes with yards and to prevent the construction of duplexes, apartments, or townhomes. Meanwhile, black neighborhoods were destabilized with the introduction of disruptive industrial uses, creating environmental and health hazards and lowering property values. So whose residence sections and property values were protected by the zoning ordinance? White ones. In black neighborhoods, public policy lowered the property values. The early appraisal and real estate industries adopted this idea without any evidence that the presence of a black person in a neighborhood was what decreased property values. Not policy, but people. It was the people with their deficient character who made the property values go down. That was the theory. And we put that theory into effect by adopting policies that excluded black people from home ownership to protect white property values without any evidence to prove that. Let's take a look at the 1924 Realtor Code of Ethics adopted the same year as Columbia's zoning ordinance. In 1924, our code said, it is unethical to sell a home to a person of color in a white neighborhood because that person's presence will decrease property values. That was our official policy through the 1950s. And members believed they would face sanctions and discipline if they sold homes to black buyers in white neighborhoods. Another method the real estate industry used to limit home ownership for black people and certain immigrants was the racially restrictive covenant. These covenants limited who a property owner could sell that property to based on the prospective buyer's race. We inserted these covenants into millions of deeds across America. And if a property owner tried to sell to a person of color in violation of the covenant, we would sue. We sued both sellers and buyers. If a white person whose deed contained a covenant tried to sell their home to a black person or an Asian person or others, we would sue. From today's vantage point, that's quite an astounding limitation on private property rights. These racial covenants were commonplace in suburban subdivisions of Columbia, South Carolina, including the Forest Hills neighborhood in which property deeds denied sale, rental, or occupancy to quote, persons of African descent. These covenants successfully shut African-Americans and others out of neighborhoods for decades, 
until the Supreme Court finally struck them down in 1948. This notion that race impacts property values was also baked into federal programs designed to boost home ownership for whites only. During the Great Depression, when foreclosures began to skyrocket, the federal government stepped in. It bought a million defaulted mortgages and changed them to fixed rate long-term loans. To boost home ownership, the Federal Housing Administration was established in 1934 with great support and encouragement from the real estate industry. The FHA would ensure private loans if banks provided sustainable, affordable mortgages. The FHA's appraisal standards required that mortgages would only be insured if the home was covered by a racial covenant. Located in a homogenous white neighborhood and removed from, quote, blighting influences. The FHA incorporated risk maps that rated neighborhoods as hazardous for investment if any Black people or certain immigrants lived there. These residential security maps had been made for hundreds of cities across the United States, including Columbia, South Carolina. Neighborhoods deemed hazardous for investment were colored red on the maps, and that's where the term redlining comes from. So from the 1930s until almost 1970, the FHA subsidized home ownership for white people while withholding that same aid from black people and certain immigrants. During that period, 98% of FHA loans went to white borrowers and white neighborhoods. Again, after World War II, the federal government, financial institutions, and the real estate industry boosted home ownership for white people while shutting Black Americans out of those opportunities. The government ensured the financing for developers to build the suburbs and paid for the highways to get to them so that the returning GIs and their families could buy affordable new homes. Those GIs mortgages were backed by the federal government. That time after World War II, that was when America transitioned from a land that was majority renters to majority homeowners, thanks to those federal policies boosting home ownership. But those new suburban developments all had racially restrictive covenants written into their deeds. It was required as a condition of the federal financing so that a black veteran who had served his country couldn't move in. From the 1930s to the 1950s, the FHA insured loans on nearly a third of new housing construction, nearly all in the suburbs and nearly all for whites only. Only a handful of the 1 million Black World War II veterans received assistance to buy a home under the GI Bill. In many cases, the Black veteran had to go back to the segregated neighborhood. Because those neighborhoods were often the only places where Black people were allowed to live, they were often severely overcrowded. Few banks would make loans, so they had little access to capital. Cities didn't pave the roads or sidewalks, install streetlights, or have regular trash collection. Lawyers and doctors live next door to laborers, cab drivers, and bootleggers. In Columbia, a neighborhood called Wheeler Hill was a tight-knit Black community where folks looked out for each other's children and shared what they had with their neighbors. Anchors of Columbia's Black community sufficient out. Some of the of Wheeler Hill likely owned businesses in what was once known as Columbia's Black Downtown, which served Black people in segregated Columbia from the turn of the century through the 1970s. While only one original business 
from this once thriving district still stands today. In its heyday, Black Downtown was home to law offices, a photography studio, barbershops, restaurants, theaters, a dentist's office, a cab company, a Black newspaper, the lighthouse and informer, and more. The proprietors of the businesses of Black Downtown, no matter how successful, were confined to living in the redlined Black neighborhoods. The 1937 redlining map of Columbia gave the Wheeler Hill neighborhood its lowest rating, noting that only 5% of the streets were paved and most properties were not connected to sewer and gas lines. The report noted the mixture of grades of population and social clash of classes, apparently referencing the fact that Black people of all occupations lived here, lawyers and doctors and bootleggers, all living together because they were not permitted in other neighborhoods. While some residents of Wheeler Hill owned their homes, most rented from absentee landlords in units that were not kept up to code. Many homes were in poor repair, lacking indoor plumbing and electricity. In 1965, the Columbia Planning Department called Wheeler Hill the fourth most blighted area in the city and prime for urban renewal. Its location near the University of South Carolina made city and university officials eager to use federal funds to seize the land, raise the neighborhoods they deemed blighted and expand the campus. From the 1950s through the 1970s, the federal urban renewal program provided funding for cities across the country to flatten black neighborhoods in the name of slum clearance. The program was seen as a win-win by both developers and social reformers. The idea was to clear substandard housing and replace it with modern clean communities. Urban renewal destroyed some 600,000 housing units across the country from the 50s to the 70s. Only a fraction of those were replaced by affordable housing. Much of the land where black people had once lived was seized by private developers. Some remained vacant and was never redeveloped. The city of Columbia and the University of South Carolina wanted to acquire Wheeler Hill and other black neighborhoods through eminent domain to remove what they called the insidious cancer of blight. Part of the city's plan was halted in 1965 when a court ruled that land taken by eminent domain had to go to some public use and not to private developers. But because using eminent domain for educational use was permitted, the city and university moved forward with the campus expansion into Wheeler Hill and some of Columbia's other large black neighborhoods. The project was gradual as the city and university didn't have a clear plan for what they would do with the land after they removed the residents. Some of the land would go to, on to house university facilities and part of Wheeler Hill became an upper class, upper middle class residential community. But officials realized in the late 1960s that they had acquired too much land. Years after its demolition, the university determined that the area of Wheeler Hill east of Pickens Street was not needed immediately and may never be required. Still, the university would continue to acquire properties in the area to quote, protect itself. University President Thomas Jones acknowledged the motivations of the project to the Columbia Housing Authority. And I quote, for many years, it has been the goal of the university and the city of Columbia to attempt to wipe out the entire slum area of approximately 12 blocks known as Wheeler Hill. Urban renewal swept across America until the federal program ended in 1974. 
leaving a legacy of displaced communities and unfinished pro projects. Black leaders had taken to calling urban renewal, Negro removal. Meanwhile, the construction of the federal interstate highway system destroyed an additional 300,000 housing units, disproportionately people of color. And the expansion of those historic freeways still threatens black communities today. Now, while the federal government was subsidizing the destruction of black communities, remember those white GIs who had returned from World War II? They were able to buy cheap homes in the new suburban developments, also subsidized by the federal government. Those white GIs saw their homes value appreciate quickly. My grandpa, David, came back from the European theater and bought one. He could build equity and pass that wealth down through my family. My family could help pay for my college education. Other families couldn't do that. I've only scratched the surface of this history. There's a lot more to tell. But let's move on to talk about what all this history means for Black Americans who want to buy homes today. Being locked out of home ownership and the ability to build equity and pass down intergenerational wealth means that according to our research, white families today are more than twice as likely as black families to be able to rely on the sale of an existing home for a down payment. Our research shows that black families are three times more likely than white households to have to tap a 401k or a pension for their down payment. My family helped pay for my college. Black households are more than twice as likely as white households to have student loan debt, and they have more. Today's system of vetting mortgages reflects the weight of this history. That inability to build wealth means that Black Americans are more than twice as likely as white Americans to be rejected for a mortgage. When Black Americans attain home ownership, they pay a higher interest rate. Studies show they pay more in mortgage insurance, fees, and taxes. Now, at NAR, we believe that in order to create a thriving, expanding housing market, we have to acknowledge these barriers and look for solutions. This history, it's ugly, it's painful, but we choose not to look away. As community leaders and stewards of home ownership, we choose to take responsibility. We are dedicated to ensuring that we must never repeat the past and that we do what we can to repair the harm. How do we do that? Well, as a first order of business, we have to acknowledge that some buyers face hurdles not of their own making. And acknowledge, as a friend of mine from the fair housing world said, we got to this place because we led deliberately and purposely with inequity. So now we have to lead deliberately with equity. Let me tell you about an exciting effort we have going on here in Washington, DC. NAR is proud to have joined NARAB, the Mortgage Bankers Association, the National Fair Housing Alliance, the Urban League, NAACP, and others as part of the Black Home Ownership Collaborative. This group is committed to creating 3 million net new Black homeowners by 2030. That is a 10 percentage point increase in the Black home ownership rate, pushing it up over 50% for the first time. It's an ambitious goal. 
The plan we have developed is comprehensive, covering everything from housing production to credit and lending. I invite you to check it out at 3by30.org. That initiative is focused on federal policy, but there are so many other things we can do to lead with equity at the state and local levels, in our associations and in our businesses to reach those communities and those buyers who are not being served. We have big challenges ahead of us, but we also know that there are 3.4 million mortgage-ready Black Americans and Black households in America right now, and an additional 2 million who are near mortgage-ready. For the future of our industry, our communities, and our economy, we have to reach these buyers. We are determined to break down barriers to make the American dream of homeownership available to as many people as possible. Thank you for allowing me to speak with you today.